John Stuart Mill argued that this, that this pleasure and pain, that's what's important when we're dealing with morality. He argued for what he called the greatest happiness principle. And the greatest happiness principle states that actions are right in the, to the extent that they promote happiness and wrong to the extent that they promote the reverse of happiness. He called his theory utilitarianism. So before we really jump into utilitarianism, it's important to remember here that Mill's significant contribution to morality is not necessarily hedonism. I mean, we've seen hedonism before, and hedonism basically is, is the idea that what's important morally, or what's you know, the value morally speaking, is uh, pleasure or happiness. <laughs> we've seen hedonism with uh, Epicurus and you know, even Aristotle to an extent, sort of, you know, when Aristotle talks about happiness. Here, uh, it seems like Mill is even borrowing from Epicurus and Aristotle. He uses the language of ends from Aristotle and pleasure from Epicurus. He even defends Epicurus against uh, some critics. Now, Mill's, you know, while, uh, while Mill does appeal to hedonism, that's not his main contribution. That's not where he's doing something new or different here. Now, what he's doing new or different here is consequentialism. What Mill claims that has moral worth is, is happiness or pleasure. He's going to hedonism on this route. He uh, is uh, doing consequentialism. And consequentialism uh, has something to say about what can be evaluated, morally speaking. Not moral worth, but what can be evaluated. What sorts of things are good and bad. So uh, we can contrast this to uh, Aristotle's virtue ethics. Now, virtue ethics says that what can be evaluated, morally speaking, is the character of a person. Uh, the uh, whether a person is honest or has integrity or is vicious or a liar, you know, th those are that's bad character and good character. Consequentialism does something different. What consequentialism says is that what is evaluated morally speaking is the act. It's the act. Okay. So what does this mean? That means uh, you know, Mill says, look, what matters morally is the consequences of actions. What happens as a result of actions. Okay? Now you can have a very honest person, you can have a person with great integrity, but if they walk around causing pain all day, that's bad. It doesn't matter if they're honest, it doesn't matter if they have integrity, if they routinely cause people anxiety, if they cause pain, if they cause misery, those actions are bad. It doesn't matter what the character of the person is. Consequentialism can be contrasted to virtue ethics, but virtue ethics and consequentialism are not the only ways to evaluate, uh, to, uh, not the only ways to morally evaluate. Okay, so virtue ethics will evaluate, they'll say what's morally, what can be morally evaluated is the character of a person. Consequentialism says it's the actions. Another way to go is uh, called deontic views of morality. Now deontic views will say what's morally evaluable is whether the person followed the rules. So under this view, there are absolute moral rules which describe how people should behave. If you follow the rules, you're doing something good. If you break the rules, you're doing something bad. But for Mill, this doesn't matter. You can follow all the rules and still cause pain. I, yeah, you can follow the rules and cause happiness. Okay, sure, that's possible. But you can follow the rules and still cause pain. You can uh, uh, cause the greatest overall happiness to drop. 
And that's bad for Mill. So his view is not a deontic view per se, I mean, following a, a set of uh, uh, rules, uh, um, rather that the consequences, consequences of the action must promote greatest overall happiness. It's the action, not the character. It's the consequences, not the rules that matter. So uh, you could be a liar and a cheat. You could be a thief and you can be, uh, you know, a scoundrel. But if you're promoting the greatest overall happiness, for Mill, that's all that matters. Now, as I said, Mill is offering a kind of hedonism. Now, his hedonism is not just, you know, base debauchery, right? Uh, he's, he's pretty clear when he defines happiness. He says happiness is uh, pleasure and the absence of pain. Now, his, his version of pleasure is, is a lot like Epicurus, I and mean, he borrows some from Epicurus here. He defends Epicurus. You know, his pleasure is not just merely, you know, the garden of carnal delights, right? It's not just... Um, you know, partying all night and going to the all-you-can-eat buffet and, uh, you know, all, you can get imagine, right, all, all, all these versions here. And Mill's ca ca careful to avoid this. He minces no words. He says uh, that there are higher pleasures and there are lower pleasures. And the higher pleasures are the ones that are worth pursuing, not the lower pleasures. And in his phrase, uh, it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be a Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. So there's a sense in which Mill is following Epicurus here, uh, but he also kind of deviates from Epicurus as well. You remember Epicurus argues, you know, he, he has his version of hedonism, he argues for basically a very simple life and a life of contemplation. And Epicurus's reasons for this is that, uh, you know, if you follow a, uh, a, a, a life of contemplation, uh, there's no pain incurred by, you know, uh, uh, no pain incurred is, is what you'd find following the other kind of carnal pleasures. So if you went on a, a night of drinking, yeah, there'd be a lot of fun, but you'd have a hangover the next day. Now, even those pleasures don't not necessarily incur a hangover, right? Just, you know, rich chocolatey desserts, right? Uh, if you have those rich chocolate desserts, Epicurus says, well, there's still pain involved because when you don't have the dessert, you miss it. And that's a pain. So, you know, Epicurus says you should follow these higher pleasures, or what Mill would call the higher pleasures, uh, because uh, they don't incur any additional pain. Now, Mill is doing something slightly different than Epicurus and distinguishing between the higher pleasures and the lower pleasures. Now, for Mill, the lower pleasures are lower, well, because they're lower, right? You might even think of uh, the lower pleasures as being lower than anything below the head. <laughs> so uh, these pleasures are, are carnal, they're visceral, they're emotional. Uh, they're lower because it's what animals enjoy, it's what pigs like, but not human beings. Right? So desserts, drinking, you know, uh, staying out all night, uh, uh, your, your average night in Las Vegas, right? <laughs> These are lower pleasures. Uh, those appeal to things that are lower than human beings. So we have lower pleasures, but then we also have higher pleasures. Higher pleasures like intellectual contemplation, mathematics, science, history. We have art, beauty, refined music, classical music, uh, even even the foods allowed, right? So long as it's you know the higher culinary delights, which takes a lot of skill and uh, effort to make, not simply a Big Mac. Uh, these are the higher pleasures uh, because, well, Mill argues that they're higher because people who experience both, the ones that go for the hard night in Las Vegas and then you know come home and spend a quiet evening in the libraries and you know, reading philosophy and history. Uh, if you experience both, you'd prefer the library over Las Vegas, Mill claims. Those that have experienced both eventually drift over to the higher pleasures, you know, the more sophisticated pleasures, the ones that require intellect, not emotion, the ones that require uh, you know, refinement, not just your guts. Okay. So, 
we got this distinction between the higher pleasures and the lower pleasures. Now here, you know, since Mill is, is kind of appealing to this idea that people who experience both will go to the higher pleasures, I think what Mill is doing here, he's, he's drifted a bit away from Epicurus. I mean, that much is clear. He's drifted a bit away from Epicurus. And at this point, I think he's doing Aristotle. Now he's saying these pleasures are higher, not because the lower pleasures aren't important, right? He's, you know, sure, every once in a while you go for a night in Las Vegas, okay. And that's not a terrible thing. but. You know, you keep drifting back to the higher pleasures. So here, I think Epicure, excuse me, I think uh, Mill is leaving Epicurus and drifting more towards Aristotle. These are higher pleasures because of the kinds of things we are. We're human beings, not pigs. We're supposed to be Socrates, not fools. We've got the two different kinds of pleasure for Mill, but we haven't really looked at the greatest overall happiness principle. Now, Mill is clear about whose happiness is important. Everyone's. No one gets special treatment. No one's happiness is more important than anybody else's. This is about as unbiased as one can get. It's not, nobody has any particular rights. Nobody has any uh, duties above anybody else. Nothing like that. Right? What matters is the greatest overall happiness. It's not any particular person, any particular person's happiness that matters, right? but happiness itself that matters. We have to raise the level of happiness, and in doing that, we're doing something good. The greatest happiness principle has implications for your actions. So you might think that with utilitarianism, you're either permitted or obligated to promote your greatest happiness. No, that's closer to egoism. Egoism would state that you can promote your happiness over others. Uh, utilitarianism doesn't even state that you have to promote the happiness of other people's over your own. No, that's not it either. Right? Sometimes you promote your happiness over others, sometimes other people's happiness over, or, over your own. What matters is raising the, the overall happiness. So when you are uh, taking your actions into consideration, it's not just yourself, and it's not just other people. It's everybody involved. So the greatest overall happiness principle requires us to promote you know, the happiness of all the people involved. Well, human beings aren't the only ones that can experience happiness in Mill's sense. Re remember, Mill defines happiness as pleasure or the absence of pain. And human beings have two different kinds of happiness, and that's true. But, uh, you know, we have the higher pleasures and the lower pleasures. But we're not the only creatures that can experience the lower pleasures. Plenty of other creatures out there can experience, you know, uh, you know, good food in a sense, or, you know, can experience eating food, and they can experience the exhilaration of running or being free out in the field and uh, flying high in the sky, or, or everything like that. And these Creatures can also experience pain. So, uh, for Mill, and you know, for lots of utilitarians, and lots of, lots of people are going to argue this, we're talking about pleasure and pain. Human beings are not the only people, not the only creatures that can experience pleasure and pain. So, according to the greatest happiness principle, remember, no individual person's happiness matters more than anybody else. And we should also, since we got more creatures than human beings that can experience pleasure and pain, the, it's actually expanded. No individual creature's happiness. No individual creature's pleasure or pain is more important than anybody else's. So when you're considering your actions, you know, the, the consequences of your actions, you have to consider not only how you're affecting human beings, but all these other creatures out there that can be made miserable by what you do.